Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Davide. I'm a production engineer at Meta on the Linux user space team. This talk is about what we're doing with the LN and how we're using to test upgrades on the production fleet at Meta. Uh, the agenda for today, we'll start with a quick introduction about what the LN is and how it's made. We'll talk about what we're specifically doing with it at Meta, what we got out of it, and how you can get involved and maybe get some value out of it as well. So, without further ado, um, ELN stands kind of for Enterprise Linux Next. Uh, there is an explanation of the puns in the name on the website that I will not try to repeat. Uh, it is a continuous review of Rawhide using the CentOS macros and toolchain. So the idea is that every day we take Fedora Rawhide as it is today, we rebuild it using the same macros that would be used as if we were cutting a new CentOS train train today, and we put the compose out. So you can take it and use it and you, have, you get a preview of what CentOS Stream would look like if we were starting today. It is part of the development process for Stream and for REL, and it is used uh, for this ongoing process. That's the link to the documentation. I'll add the slides on the website later, so you don't need to worry about the links. Um, so here's how the sausage is made, more or less. Uh, development work happens in ROID all the time. ROID is continuously rebuilt into ELN. ELN is used to test how these changes would look like in the future CentOS stream release. At some point uh, next month-ish, I believe, uh, the first branching for stream will occur, and by, at that point we will have a new set of branches and a new set of repos and everything, and that will be stream 10, and then stream 10 will be stabilized, and then eventually we'll have rel 10, uh, and so on. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering about the colors, this slide comes from an older presentation I gave. The uh, orange boxes are because those are all things you can actually contribute to and work on if you would like. Uh, you can't contribute to Red unless you actually work at Red Hat, which I do not. Uh, so how this actually works is that the composers are made using something called the ODCS, which is the on-demand compose service, uh, which is a thing that is able to make distribution composes and put them online so people can consume them. The package that itself is defined in the content resolver, which was an offshoot of the Fedora minimization project uh, that is still developed. Uh, if you go on tiny distro builders, you can see the actual package set and play with it and slice and dice it. That's a picture I took of yesterday that gives you an idea. It, you can also see kind of the ebbs and flows in this. As we get closer to the branch point, you can notice this is getting lower because I guess folks are realizing they don't really want to maintain stuff long term for 10 years, so they're chopping it out, which seem, seems reasonable to me. Uh, now, this is just for ELN itself, which is what will end up in CentOS Stream and in REL. Um, most people, I would say, do not run just that. They need additional packages that you generally get from Appel. To test those, uh, we came up with something called the ELN Extras. The idea within ELN Extras is an additional set of packages that are composed together with ELN, but are not going to be part of ELN itself. Um, it's still kind of in flux how we're going to do this, but the general idea is that we will use this set of packages to bootstrap Appel 10 so we can get a head start there and try to make life a bit easier both for users and for packagers. This is also defined in Content Resolver. You can look it up there. Um, you can actually contribute your definitions here. So if you maintain packages in Appel and would like to get started or have them ready for Appel 10, you can put up a PR against that GitHub project. There's a little YAML file you have to fill in. Uh, and your packages will end up uh, getting continuously rebuilt in ELN. Now, of course, this means you sign up for maintaining them. So if they break, you, you will need to fix them. But you'll need to fix them eventually anyway. So, oh, And again, that's the text set. Uh, this work is coordinated by the ELN SIG, uh, which is a Fedora, a Fedora SIG. Uh, we hang out in Matrix and in IRC. Uh, while ELN is primarily a thing that is happening on uh, Fedora and Red Hat infrastructure and uses a lot of internal components, work on the project is by no means restricted to folks that work at Red Hat. Uh, you're welcome to join and hang out there. There's regular meetings on Friday where it's discussed. Uh, these uh, meetings are also good to hang out if you're curious on what's going to happen in Stream 10 down the road. Um, I'll talk about this later, but this has been very useful, for example, to get ideas, features that might be coming down the road that you'd want to know about if you actually run this in production. Uh, and here's a link on details about the SIG itself. So much for the intro, let's talk about what we're doing with this and Meta. Uh, before I do that, a quick primer on uh, the infra at Meta. Uh, as you might have heard, Meta has a lot of machines. Uh, we have millions of servers. Uh, these servers, uh, these are all physical machines running in data centers across the world. They all run CentOS stream uh, right now. We always run CentOS. We started with CentOS Linux. Well, I started in 2012, and we were running CentOS Linux 5 back then. We went through several major release transitions. So we went from 5 to 6, 6 to 7, Linux 7 to Stream 8. We just about finishing now Stream 8 to Stream 9. 
Uh, I was very happy to discover last month that we got rid finally of the last CentOS Linux 7 hosts. So we don't have those anymore in production, so that's nice. Uh, so I could put 2022 on that line. Uh, I expect we'll be done. We'll probably have a long tail of eight stuff at the end of the year, but we, we should be mostly done with it by the end of the year. Uh, right now we're at 86% on nine. Uh, there's still some containers on eight. Uh, actually, eight is still, I think, the majority on containers, but containers are comparatively easier, I would say. Uh, uh, and for context, whenever we do this migration, we already provision the whole fleet. We don't do in-place updates for production systems. So this is wiping the machine and installing, which is fairly expensive, as you might imagine. Um, now, these, our customers don't love these upgrades because they're kind of expensive because they, you're wiping their machines, they have to spend time qualifying the distribution. Usually, the way this has worked in the past is that we get CentOS, the new CentOS thing release drops, we start working on it, we put it out, we will play with it, we find some major issue that delays everything by six months um, because that's how it works. Like, it, it's, it's absolutely normal. When you have a large deployment, it's pretty common to end up having to deal with these things. Uh, with nine in particular, the SHA-1 deprecation ended up being a fairly sizable annoyance um, because we had a lot of packages that, were, that predated that that had to be rebuilt. We also had a lot of packages coming from external vendors that uh, had shall we say, questionable packaging practices uh, that required a lot of work. Um, so in general, we had been looking at ways to make this process better and more streamlined. When we did uh, nine, I actually started working on this, started working from the very first beta that came out, and that helped quite a bit because we could get a head start uh, since the, basically since branching time. Uh, but you still get kind of surprises because while if you follow Fedora, you kind of know what will probably end up because you know where it's branching from, it's hard to tell until it drops. Um, the way we do this better is if we could start this earlier, and that's kind of where ELN comes in for us. The idea with ELN is using it so that we can streamline bring up of major OS releases. Turn this from a thing that we have to do at qualification time when a new major release drops to a thing that we do all the time. So we can continuously validate what's gonna come down the pipe, find issues as they come up. When something comes up, we can either figure out internally if it's we that we fucked up and fix it, or if it's something that we have to discuss with the community because maybe there's a better solution that can help everyone. It also allows us to identify policy changes early on, things that will come in the distribution that might impact us, things that are being deprecated, new things that are coming up. Uh, and because this is, is a continuous effort and because we start long before, it's a much more pleasant experience for customers because instead of having to deal with, oh, all my packages don't install anymore and I have a month to fix it, now is all my packages don't install anymore, but this isn't a production system. Maybe I have a year to fix it. It's much nicer. People are a lot happier when you tell them they have a year to fix it and they can like, sort of sort it out at their own leisure. Um, and longer term, we would like to have an actual CI platform where we continuously roll out ELN on production systems for some value of production um, so that we, every customer with different workloads can get a sense of what's gonna come in down the pipe and do this validation at their own pace. Now, to do this, uh, we started actually bringing up ELN in our infrastructure. And bringing up ELN is about the same effort as bringing up a new CentOS stream release. Uh, so this was broken down into getting the repos, hooking them up into our update pipeline, adding them to our config management system, which is Chef, actually provisioning and building provisioning, and provisioning machine, and then deploying it and qualifying. Uh, and pretty much every step here involved fixing bugs, uh, mostly on our end. So starting from repos, the repos come from ODCS, as I mentioned. There's a, the daily-ish snapshot or weekly-ish, depending on when it's cut, uh, shows up there. Uh, we didn't particularly want to scrape that with wget-r, because that seemed kind of bad. Uh, so we worked with the infra folks at Fedora to get rsync, to get an rsync endpoint exposed from there so we could mirror it using rsync. And now we have these exposed on our public mirror. So if you want to access that and you don't want to hammer the Fedora servers, you can use the mirror on mirror the facebook.net. I believe we sync that uh, daily-ish. So it should be reasonably up to date. Um, but we don't consume that directly internally. We actually snapshot it via another process that we'll, call, that we'll talk about in a minute we'll called rolling OS updates. Uh, now this is only for the base repos, but of course there's also Appel. So for Appel, we use the uh, ELN extras that I mentioned before. So we started populating two workloads in ELN extras one for packages that we maintain as part of the CentOS Hyperscale SIG, uh, which is where we do most of our upstream work within the CentOS project, 
And then other workloads for packages that are really specific to Meta that uh, we, we felt it would be easy to have all in one place to keep track of. Uh, you can look this up. I put the screenshots here so you can see roughly the volume. The giant jump was when I started testing development systems, which have a lot of random packages on them. So I ended up adding a few dozens there. Oh, that's what this looks like for. And these are all packages that we'll be maintaining then in FL10, or at least assisting to maintain, because we're not the, the primary maintainers on all of these, obviously. Um, now, once we have the repos, we have to hook them up into our base pipeline. Uh, I won't talk about rolling gas updates in detail here. Uh, I talked about this in other talks, and it's, it's not terribly interesting because it's fairly internal to Meta. But the idea is that for CentOS Stream, we snapshot the production repos of Stream every two weeks. We roll them out on the fleet across two weeks. We do this via Chef, and effectively, Chef will update the DNF.com from the machine and run the DNF upgrade, and it, it just works, more or less. Uh, when it doesn't work, people get tickets and fix it. Uh, in the case of ELN, uh, this process is much easier to some extent because we just made a release train called ELN, which is going to be continuously updated. We snapshot it every day initially because that made it easy to iterate quickly and later every week. We don't really care about in-place updates for ELN because what we really care about testing is uh, the provisioning and initial bring up. We don't particularly care about testing updates from one ELN from yesterday to ELN from today. So we just stopped out all the tests for that and automatically promote all the snapshots. And it, this, this basically works. Uh, the only caveat here is that ELN composes can be broken because we publish all composes regardless of state. So we need to filter for only composes that are tagged as finished. Otherwise, you end up trying to roll out something that is missing three quarters of the distribution. Uh, also, ELN Xbox workflows can fail. They can fail, for example, if you add a package that doesn't build. Uh, when the workflow fails, the entire workflow is excised from the compose, which is obviously bad. Uh, so right now, we just keep an eye on it, but I need to actually write monitoring. So we, we do the same thing and validate them before pulling them in. OK, now we have repos. Uh, we need to do the config management side. The config management side is fairly straightforward uh, with one caveat. Uh, ELN is odd in that it really is Fedora. It identifies itself as Fedora OID. If you cat etc. OS release, it says Fedora OID. The only way you can tell it's ELN is because it has variants set to ELN. However, everything else about it is CentOS. And we really want to validate it as if it were CentOS. So what we ended up doing was something horrible, which was adding logic to detect ELN based on the variant ID, and then monkey patching it so that it actually looked like CentOS. So in our chef code, we have methods that do like if not CentOS. And those will return through on ELN. Um, do not do this. This is a terrible idea. And like, we did this because it worked for what we were trying to do, but not something I would recommend in general. After that, it was just the, the usual loop of like testing it on a machine, iterating, finding there's, oh, this package is missing, and adding it to ELN extras, or, oh, this logic is hard coding send 9, but we can actually just uh, flip the convert the, um, the gate and make it, make it hard code 8, because it's just a negative thing, things like that. Uh, our open source books are there. There isn't much that's ELN specific in there, but I put the link in case you're interested. Um, if you use Puppet or Ansible or anything else, it's I expect it would be roughly similar. Uh, frankly, I expected this to be the, a major pain, and it turned out to be very straightforward. OK, now we have config management, and we want to do provisioning. Uh, provisioning at Meta is complicated. And to sidestep the issue, and because there's a circular dependency that you need Chef to have provisioning working, and vice versa, because the provision images are built with Chef, but you need machines to be able to test that Chef is working, um, we did another horrible thing which was converting in place existing CentOS Stream 9 hosts to ELN with ENF distro sync. To my surprise, this actually works. Uh, not only it works, but it produces systems that still boot. Um, initially, I expected to do this and then throw the machines away, but they still booted afterwards uh, with minor, minor caveats. And I, I would not do this in production. It is a terrible idea. But it worked very well for development, because I was able to take uh, development systems, convert them in place, iterate quickly on the chef stuff, and then later when the chef stuff was sorted out, get the provision images going, and then we could provision machines from scratch. Um, the provisioning system uses an internal thing uh, that isn't particularly useful outside of Meta, but basically they're, they're just image, images that get dropped onto machines, as you might expect. Uh, the images are continuously delivered and tested. Uh, so the, the provisioning system will build the image, try to install a bunch of machines with it, and then tag it if it's good or not good. Right now, we're at the point where we're effectively in feature parity with 9. We actually were able to refactor quite a bit of this logic to make it saner and better support future distributions. After that, it's just a matter of testing. 
So we started using, we have a small set of machines we call kernel tests that we use for doing kernel and hardware enablement work, which is very handy for these things because it doesn't run anything. So you just have to get the base OS working. So we got that going and that took care of most of the basic chef stuff. Then we switched to doing the development servers. The development servers are great because nobody cares if like your own development server is broken. There's no services running on it except your editor. Uh, but they have a ton of packages on it because they have to support all possible work cases from like building the Android operating system to doing God knows what. So these are very useful for finding packages that were missing. We did needed to add to LN extras. We didn't quite know. Also, we were able to work with the folks that maintain these systems to discuss, oh, this thing you're doing here, maybe you should rethink it because it will probably break in the future. So this is kind of where we're at now. Um, right now I'm working to expanding this to the container platform systems, uh, which is the ones that I was actually interested in targeting since the start, because that's where the product, most of production actually runs. And those will give us a good, a good measure of whether this will actually work long term. And also the container system has extensive unit tests that should be able to tell us when things break very quickly. So let's talk about what we got out of this. Took about four months to go from nothing to having provisioning working. Uh, this isn't four months of like has down work. This is four months of like spending time on this, but also doing other work. Um, I suspect if you were speed running this, you could probably do it in half time. Uh, we now have some dozens of systems running on ELN. I can't say exact numbers for reasons, but um, it's not a huge amount. Uh, I expect this will expand in probably low thousands at some point. I don't think we'll ever have a large deployment of this because it doesn't really make sense. Uh, and because these machines will effectively not be doing useful production work. But we have started conversation on wider deployments because at this stage, what I would like to see is different product owners at Facebook to start trying this out and evaluating. So say the database folks can use this to help the qualification for the databases in the future and so on and so forth. We've also began preparing for SenseTrain 10 because uh, the work we were able to do with ELN made us aware of changes that might be coming in 10 that we should start thinking about. We are also able to start testing things like the NF5 because ELN is built from Fedora, it has the NF5, so we can actually install it and play with it and test it and start integrating it. Um, changes that are being deployed and discussed as part of ELN uh, can also be integrated and, and discussed internally. There's discussions ongoing if you, uh, if you uh, look at the mini meeting meet youth for previous ELN meetings. There were discussions about, for example, dropping 32 bit packages. That's something that I was very happy to know ahead of time because I can start talking to the people that use them. Um, and then, of course, we found bugs and we fixed bugs. And I will give you a few examples. Uh, so, this was the very first thing we found that when I put a machine up, uh, immediately after I converted the guy ran RPM QA and I had a shit ton of errors. And they were all that weird invalid OpenGPG signature. So you might know that RPM for 18 ships with Sequoia, which uh, swapped the entire open PGP implementation with one that actually works. Um, notably, these validates packages and make sure the packages are actually compliant. Uh, it turns out our internal signing service was using a Golang library, and the Golang library was generating invalid signatures by design. Literally, if you read through the comments, it says, we know this is broken, we don't care. Um, so that, that wasn't ideal. Uh, luckily, we found out that the ProtonMail folks had a fork of this library that was actually compliant. So we swapped it in. Uh, this fixed our signing service, but of course, we had all of the existing packages that now had to be fixed. Uh, so we had to wait for a few mass rebuild cycles. We still have a long tail of this because not everything is auto rebuilt, but it's at the point that it's manageable at least. If you have your own signing implementation, I highly recommend making sure this is not happening. Also, maybe don't use Golang. Um, <laughs> now, this isn't all the fun we had with Sequoia. Uh, after the, we had the packages, we installed a system from scratch, and we saw our key wasn't importing. Now, you might remember I mentioned in stream 9, uh, the policy disallows SHA-1. Turns out RPM never validated the key at all. So when you imported the signing key on 9, it, it imported just fine, even if it was signed with SHA-1. Probably even if it was signed with MD5, I suspect. So um, this is a problem. Uh, we, turns out the key was not actually valid. We were using a very old, uh, well, it, funnily enough, it wasn't an old key. It was a key that was kept updated, but they kept signing with SHA-1 for reasons. Um, so we fixed that, and then it was fine. There's actually a very handy tool that I got packaged into Appel for this, call, um, that was already in Fedora, that's part of Sequoia, and I branched for Appel, because uh, SQ Keering Linter, you can feed it a key, and it will tell you in, in human readable form what is wrong with it. 
It also has a fixed option where if you have the private key for the key, and it's an actual private key, not an HSM or something, you can just fix it and spit out a fixed key. Um, that can be handy if you're your own key. If you have an HSM, you will need to work with your security folks on how to fix this. Uh, you may want to talk to your vendors about this. Uh, I audited ours. Uh, we, I would say at least 50% of repos that we were consuming were invalid. And most of the, these folks, when I talked to them, they had no idea what I was talking about. And it took quite a bit of effort to make people aware that this was actually an issue and they should do something about it. Um, also, if you're resigning your key, make sure you don't actually invalidate your key, because otherwise, upgrades will be very painful for users. Uh, which actually happened with at least one vendor, from what I can tell. OK, enough about RPM. Uh, the other fun thing was Util Linux. So ROI ships with the very latest Util Linux 239, which has a lot of fun features. It also had a couple of regressions that we managed to hit. Uh, one was easy. They changed the option parsing for NS Enter. NS Enter has some like, bespoke logic for option parsing. That changed slightly, where you, you like, had to pass equal something instead of just doing option value. Uh, OK, we fixed it. That wasn't a big deal, I would say. That was also easy to work around. The more fun one was the mount API. Um, there's, a, there's this blog post that explains the mount API. Uh, we discovered this when I, I started provisioning machines that they never came up. And I would go on console and see a slew of error coming from systemd. And then when I finally managed to find where the console password is, I would get in and see that the root file system was read-only. And if you passed RW on boot, it would boot fine, but it would for, for the life of me, I couldn't get it to remount. And if you try to remount manually, you get e inval back. Turns out there is a bug in Util Linux that if you're running an old kernel, it doesn't quite detect that the mount API is fucked, so you should use the old one. Uh, funnily enough, I was talking to Aidan the other day, and this was actually independently discovered in Rawhide thanks to OpenQA. But we don't run OpenQA for ELN, so on ELN, this slipped through. Uh, this is fixed in Util Linux, by the way. Uh, I think I put up a PR to backport it in Fedora. I don't know if that got merged, but. I'm sure it will get sorted out quickly there anyway. But this is a good example of something that we were able to catch quickly and get sorted out in a way that is hopefully beneficial for everyone. Um, there's also a couple of other things I wanted to mention. Uh, by the nature of how ELN is built, it is like 98% like CentOS, but not exactly like CentOS. So first of all, sometimes like just people playing fuck up. Uh, and like it happens. In this case, uh, we found that ODD was installed using the Fedora rule set and not the RHEL rule set because there just wasn't any logic in the package for this. I, I guess when, when it was branched for 9, the maintainer probably branched it and then just updated the, the CentOS side of it and never backported the changes. Uh, so that was easy. Put a PR, do the conditional. We only noticed it because in Chef we disabled ODD, and the way you disable it is different depending on whether it's the Fedora or the CentOS role set. Uh, the more interesting one was systemd. So uh, you might know that systemd has this thing called presets that defines what services will start up on boot, um, on force boot when you install the package. So it will tell you when you're installing this package, should the service be enabled or disabled by default. Uh, the presets from Fedora and the presets from CentOS are very different because the use cases for the distributions are different. ELN uses the Fedora presets. Uh, so you might want to keep an eye on this if you deploy this. Uh, the, way, the way we found this out is because Fedora explicitly disables systemd network D which we want to explicitly enable instead. Uh, and we never actually did that. We just, because there was no preset for it, it would get enabled by default in our case. Um, so that's something that caught up by surprise. I don't think there's, uh, we've discussed this with the SIG, there's not quite clarity right now on how this is going to be handled on the, on the sender stream side after branching. I expect this will probably keep deviating because there's not really a good way to, to manage them. Uh, but that's something else you should probably be aware of. All right. Uh, so what can you do with this? Uh, well, as I said, CentOS Intent will be branching soon. There is a thread on the belt that I would encourage you to read that talks about the plan, how, how the branching is going to happen, when it's going to happen, how this will work out. You also have about two weeks to get a system-wide change in Fedora, if you would like. And getting a system-wide change in Fedora now has a higher chance of it maybe ending up in CentOS Stream. Definitely a higher chance of having to do less paperwork than later. Because once it's branched, it's a lot harder to get changes into stream for obvious reasons. Uh, but also, if you maintain anything that runs on stream or on rel, and you would like to get a head start, this is a good time to start playing with ELN and trying it out. Uh, it's also a good time, because once stream 10 is fully branched, ELN will transition to 11. And we'll, uh, we'll be able to start doing this all over again. Uh, as I said, you can join the SIG. 
the SIGGAN goes on matrix and on, and on IRC, it, the channel, the channels are bridged. If you maintain packages in Appel, you can contribute them to extras. Uh, that's a link to the ELM website in general that has information and details about the project. Uh, the documentation itself is on GitHub, as is most of the code that controls the build itself. And uh, the Fedora minimization work and contract resolver is what actually controls the set of packages that you can find there. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Yes? You said you didn't find out about this if you're open QA because we don't want to open QA on the ELM. We could. Would that be helpful? Yes, that would be very helpful. Oh, uh, and the question was, uh, we found this out because we didn't run OpenQA on ELN and whether that would be helpful, and yes, it would be very helpful. Which bits? Uh, so I think, in general, testing composes would be useful. Uh, which, test of, which set of yeah. tests, I think, is something we would need to, yeah, we would need to sit down and figure out. Um, I don't know if doing the, the same test that we do for OHID is useful. I expect a lot would fail just because it's a very different system. Yeah. So maybe looking at what kind of tests are done as part of qualifying stream and rel on the other side of the house and seeing if it makes sense to port those to open QA, maybe. Okay. Um, that could be interesting to look at. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. I meant to add this, but I didn't know where to slot it in. Yes, there is support. There are shows for ELN. There is also support for a uh, packet to build against ELN. Yeah, so we, what we actually do is for our open source projects, we use packet to get continuous, continuous builds and signal so that when folks internally land changes, they won't break the open source builds. And we, we build this in copper for all the releases, including ELN, for packages branched to Appel. That works really well. Neil. So uh, it depends. There are ISOs. Uh, how do you install ELN was the question. Um, so there are ISOs that you could theoretically use. I have never tried them. Um, what I would do is the like, DNF install root process that you use normally to build images, or you can use your favorite image builder. Um, then who is there landed support for building ELN images in MKOSI the other week. So that's an option. Uh, I believe it, they should work with any other image builder. It should work with Kiwi probably yeah, too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in general, I think this will depend a lot on what you want to do with it. Any other questions? Dan. So that was, uh, that was the question I actually had, and that that's where the discussion started. The, the question is whether we could fix the preset issue by providing a Fedora ELN release package with the, with the rel presets. The problem is that we don't know what the real, what the real presets will be, because you can't just blank use the ones for nine, because it's different enough. And my understanding is that the way these presets are developed as part of stream is that they start from the raw eyed ones, and then over time they get morphed into the new ones. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. You don't know what it will look like, but as time goes, you figure out the configuration of the yep. chain, then you integrate it. So I don't see it as a problem for the people that they know. You could just uh, start with the one CL9, and then they get adjusted you know, later. I would be in favor of having something, because it would make my life easier. Um, but it's definitely, I think it's definitely something we can revisit. This would be a good argument to discuss in one of the next SIG meetings. Yeah. Because like the, the way that it worked out with the pre-made was they took the preset from RHEL 8 and it led to a broken system and people had to copy things into raw from raw height into a bit by bit until things started working again. So for the kernel we have the advantage that we have of course every one to new release and we can look at what config changed. But perhaps uh, you could have somebody that or a bot that every time uh, the preset change in the Fedora raw height package open an issue on the ELN package so that people actually take a look at the chain and decide what to do. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, we, um, and to repeat for the stream, um, the proposal was that we have a process where whenever there's changes to the package in ROID, an issue is filed to see if the corresponding ch change is meaningful for ELN and for the future stream as well. I think that's a great idea and it's probably something we should look at. 
Yes. Uh, Neil says that's probably meaningful only if the package is forked. Uh, I don't think so, because you might have packages where you want a service to be enabled in Fedora but not in stream because it's because it's not supported, because it's not part of the default set, you know. Uh, you had a question back there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen breakage from this just yet. Uh, I expect I will at some point. I knew about this change because it came up in the last in the last meeting. And to repeat for the for the stream, um, uh, there's a change in ELN where it will use x86 64b3 as the baseline for x86, and this will cause breakage because. Anything older than us, well, I believe, don't quote me on that, we'll, we'll yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stop working. Uh, so what, where is it directly from? Anything, any hardware that is older than a certain ge CPU generation, which is probably as well, will stop working. Um, so uh, we haven't seen breakers from this in production yet, because uh, the systems I was testing this on were all fairly new. Uh, I did start inventorying stuff. I am. I don't have hard data on this, but I am fairly sure we would see some breakage from this, and this is something we will need to deal with. Um, yeah, there's a, I think there's a long enough window, though, between now and when Stream 10 and RHEL 10 will be released, that I expect it, it should be less painful than it looks like now, hopefully. <laughs> yes. That should be. And to, to summarize for the stream, uh, one, e one area that's impacted by these is VMs, uh, because KVM right now, by default, uses, uh, uh, Kimu uses an unsupported uh, asset that's older than V3, and, but that is getting addressed and should get backported uh, to ROI as well, hopefully. Uh, yeah, but I mean, we should have tests for a lot of things. <laughs> 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 but yes, I don't disagree there. <laughs> I, I haven't done much testing on the virtualization stack, so I don't have signal on my end on this. I was going to talk to the virtualization folks on my side to see if they could hook uh, this up in whatever they do. I contact me and the other virtualization folks that are there before. Sure, <laughs> will do. Thank you. Anything else? Going once, going twice. All righty. Thank you very much. <laughs>